Well, grace and peace, everyone. It's good to be here with all of you. That was actually the perfect song for what we're going to be talking about today. So thanks for picking that, as you'll see. Uh, so as most of you know, we, we finished the Sermon on the Mount. It was 37 messages to get through the Sermon on the Mount. And often what, what I do is after finishing a, a major segment, take a break and do something topical for a couple of sessions just to catch our breath, and then we'll go back to Matthew. We're going to finish Matthew uh, sometime in the next few years. Um, so we're, we're in Matthew 8, the pace will pick up, uh, but we will, we will finish it. And uh, what, what, I, what I want to do is talk about something that is, something that I've noticed to be a, a fairly prominent problem in a lot, of, a lot of circles. And I'm first going to illustrate it with a story. So the year was 2005. It was December of 2005, and I was about to propose to my soon-to-be fiance, Laura. I grew up in Southern California, in LA specifically, and there was a place that I spent quite a bit of time in when I was in college, which was an intervarsity camp on an island called Catalina. Catalina is a beautiful island right off the coast of Southern California, and I'd go there a lot with my campus group. And so I decided that I would go and propose there on Catalina Island. So there was this really beautiful hike that you could walk up to uh, that I did many times. And uh, I had the whole thing planned out and really excited about all that. Well, get there on the island and uh, the boat ride was fine, but then it starts to rain. And it was like this kind of really bad, cold, spitting rain. It was very unpleasant. And it quickly became obvious that this was not going to succeed for a hike at all. And so we were just kind of like wandering in and out of shops because we were trying to take cover from this rain. And then finally, I'm realizing this whole plan is just not going to work. And so I decided to, to basically uh, go to plan B. And so I said, hey, let's just go back. Let's go back to... Uh, to the mainland, and so we go back to the to the boat area there. But we, of course, we don't have any reservations because our boat was supposed to go at a later time. And so we're there waiting for the boat, and we're just like you can see all the people, and you're kind of on standby, just like when you're on standby for a plane. And I'm there thinking, like, please, please, please let there be some spots because I think the next boat. I don't remember now, but. The next boat was like two hours or something, and I'm just picturing what are we going to do in the rain on the day I'm hoping to propose in, the, in this cold, miserable rain. Well, um, eventually, you know, we're there in this line, and we're just hoping about, about getting onto the, the boat, and they call our number, our name, whatever it was, and we were just so happy, and we get back on the boat and go back, and plan B turned out well. I still did propose that night, but it was a, a different different setting, different venue. But I remember very well being in that line. I'm sure you remember being in that line. And we were just just totally focused on hoping that we would get on this boat. And we couldn't even really talk. I remember being distracted because I'm just like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, boat, come on, give us a spot here. We really want a spot here. And um, right, you've had that experience, right? When you're waiting for a plane and you're on standby, it, you can't really just relax. You can't just like do your work because you're just, your whole mind is like, am I gonna make this plane? And the, that, that kind of nervousness, that lack of confidence is something that I'm gonna tie in to a common problem that I've seen quite a bit in the last couple months, which is a lack of assurance of salvation, okay? So if you don't have a very good grounding in an assurance of salvation, my thesis is that you're, you're, you're kind of not ever really going to be able to be as effective in your Christian life because you're just like, am I on this? Am I not? What's going on? And your, your whole mind is consumed with the sense of anxiety about much more fundamental matters, right? You just don't have that baseline level of confidence. So again, use that illustration. Picture the one person over here, they're about to get on the plane. They know they've got a ticket. Their seat is assigned. Right? You're kicking back in the lounge area, you're talking, you're on your computer, you, have, you don't have any concern at all. But the person who doesn't know that they've got a seat on that plane, they're in a completely different frame of mind. They can't really just settle in and, and enjoy the moment, just like we couldn't enjoy the moment, even though it was the day that I was going to propose. 
And so this is a big, big problem. Uh, this is a huge, huge problem. And the, one of the things that I've, I did in one of the messages earlier was I, you know, I wrote up this, this illustration for everyone, which, which was one where you know, we tend to think of the world, we're encouraged to think of the world at first glance as here's non-Christians over here, and then here are, here are Christians over here, right? But then as we talked about, this is not the way that Jesus depicts the world, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. He sees the world as, as being a tripartite world, where instead of two categories, there's really, there's really a third stripe over here. And this group over here are those who are in that category of saying, Lord, Lord. And they are false Christians. They're self-deceived. And then over here we have those who are doing the will of the Father. Okay, so, so Jesus makes the world more complex. And he, he spends a lot of his time, particularly in the book of Matthew, addressing this segment here, this middle segment, of people that are, they think they're fine, they think they're on the way to salvation, but in fact they're on the broad road that leads to destruction. And if we think about this now, uh, so this is the, the kind of our baseline here, but if we think about this with respect to assurance of salvation, so we have this kind of non-Christian world over here, and I'm going to say this world here is sort of unsure and generally insecure, but just kind of gener doesn't think that much about eternal matters. This group over here, we know, thinks that, that I'm going to put sure in quotes. They're sure, but actually, they're insecure. Right? They're, they're really not in a great place at all, this, this middle stripe here. And that's the group that Jesus warns about in Matthew 7. But then, this group over here, that is in fact secure, often, not always, but often, this group here is unsure and secure at the same time. Now, some are sure and secure, but you have this ironic reversal, right? Where in in the way that you would hope it would be that this group would be kind of unsure and, and just like, oh, I don't know where I'm at. But in fact, the way that the world is, this group here tends to be the most confident about their salvation. They're not even registering the fact that they're in a very vulnerable place. And often, as I said, people who are over here, who you want to see just like, yeah, confident in God and not, not really worrying about where they're at. They're often unsure, despite the fact that they have a security in God. Okay? It's going to take me probably at least two, maybe three messages to get through all this about assurance of salvation. So I'm going to only be able to start today. But this is a very important subject. And I'll say one of the things that has me especially concerned, I've gone on six trips in the last, I think, seven weeks. And this has come up a number of times that the, the, there, there's an, a stress on obedience that we have in kingdom churches, which is really good, mm -hmm. right? It's very good, but it can have kind of a morbid, right. um, unsettling feeling where a lot of people who come into our circles can have a sense of, have I done enough? Have I obeyed enough? Am I, am I really among the saved, right? This is a, a major problem. And so we have to deal with this head on. And I want to make sure that while we stress, in a biblical way, obedience, we don't produce a lack of security and assurance, which we're supposed to have. There's a couple of verses I'm just going to read here. They're pretty familiar verses. But this is, first one is from 1 John 5, where John is writing and he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. One of the reasons that he writes the book of 1 John is to give a confident assurance, not that you may guess or that you may hope, but that you may know that you have eternal life. 
2 Peter 1 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And I like the way he puts that there, because if your call and election isn't sure, you're just going to be stumbling all over the place. Right? You're not ever really going to be able to get that traction, that, that settled confidence that we're supposed to have as Christians. Okay, so that's just setting the stage about what we're going to talk about here. And like, like I said, it's going to take a while here. Uh, but very, very important ideas that I want us to be rock solid on because I want us to be among those who are doing the will of the Father, who hear from Jesus on the last day, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into the joy of your Lord, but at the same time are sure and secure, right? And so we can have that effectiveness that, that helps us. So we're going to, like I said, spend some time on this. I recently had a birthday this past week. It's great. I felt very loved. My wife did a great job with my birthday, and I always enjoy that. It's a special day. And uh, last night, I heard that, that familiar knock, that Zach knock that he kind of trademarks. And uh, so I opened the door, and Zach and Crystal were there at our front door, and they had brought a very lovely dessert and ice cream for, for me. They know there's a particular dessert that I like. And imagine what they would have felt like if I, if, or imagine what I would have felt like, rather, if they had said after they gave me this gift, will that be cash or charge? Right? right. I've been like, cash or charge? I thought this was a gift, right? One of the things that I want us to, to remember is, as we start off here, salvation is portrayed always in scripture as a gift, never as the product of earning. And it would be very sad <laughs> if we, we had it in the wrong framework, just like I would feel very sad if they said cash or charge to me. I'm also going to say that I think that this area, this has got to be, it's in the top three areas of Satan's just absolute focus, right? right. I mean, this has got to be an area where he wants the whole world to be backwards, right? He wants everybody here in this category to be super confident of their salvation, right? Because they're on the broad road. And if you're on the broad road, he's got to be thinking, please stay secure in your salvation. Uh, trust in the finished work of Jesus, all that kind of stuff. And, and he's going to love that. And then he's really going to want to destabilize these, pe these people over here, right? It's going to exactly be backwards. So assurance has to be one of the main areas where the devil is active. He wants the true disciples of Jesus to be crippled with fear, to be less effective, and he wants to, as it says in John 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. Mm -hmm. He wants to steal joy. He wants to steal effectiveness. And I want us to be on the alert for these patterns. I'm going to make another couple of observations, which I've noticed in my years as a, as a Christian, that it's across the board that you find people who struggle with assurance of salvation. But I think there's a slight excess, my guess is 60-40, maybe 70-30, of women who struggle more with assurance of salvation than men. Uh, often it's people who are known for being perfectionists. They really <laughs> wrestle with, with uh, a sense of value coming from their work. Uh, it's often associated with anorexia. It's often associated with pleasing people, this, this sense of like, oh, I really want to please people, and if I don't please people, I'm crushed. Uh, there are other sources of lack of assurance. I think I've noticed more in men. These are huge generalizations, and you're going to find deviations here, but uh, I've noticed often in men, the sources tend to be more from, from sin and from recurring sin patterns that can rob a person of their assurance maybe not seeing fruit in their lives. Uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I read a book on this subject. I don't know if you remember this, but this, this man who writes this book, very candid, uh, so he, he comes from an environment where you pray the sinner's prayer, right? One of those types of churches. I was raised in that. And he estimates in this book that he asks Jesus into his heart by the t but before the, t before the age of 20, 5,000 times, uh, 5,000, this is his estimate, because he, ne he never was confident enough that he got it right. And he was always like, oh, I just, I don't have it exactly right. He was rebaptized four times and his church gave him a locker 
in the baptismal changing area because they just they were like, hey, you're just this is where this is where you're at, right? So um, that's maybe an extreme example, but I think many of us can identify with that. So all we're going to do today, I have a I have a fairly modest goal, but we're going to spend a lot of time on my goal here. Uh, because I'm going to set us up next time for an analogy that I'm not going to tell you now. Um, so I'm going to hold you in suspense for my big analogy. But what we're going to do is we're going to lay the groundwork for my analogy. Uh, and I want to try to get at the question, what is the grounds of the assurance of salvation? What is the basis of the assurance of salvation? Okay, so if somebody were to ask you, okay, we're sitting in this room. There's a lot of people in this room right now. What, what is the, the grounds or what is the basis that we can feel okay that this floor is not going to fall in? I've actually worried about that at times when we've had like 90 people in here that <laughs> this floor is going to fall in. Um, well, if somebody were to ask me that question about what is the grounds and confidence that I have that this floor is not going to fall in, I would say, well, this house was built in 1875. So it's been around. It's seen a lot of years. It's 100 and, what is that, 135 years? No. 145 years old. Uh, I, I hired an inspector when we bought this house to examine the foundation of the house. He did a really good job. He was a, seemed like a competent inspector. And he said the bones of this house were secure. So what is the basis of any biblical basis of an assurance of salvation? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to assert today that the basis is the character and the goodness of God. Okay, the character and the goodness of God. And like I said, I'm setting us up for an analogy for next time. But for now, let's, we're going to work with this. And in particular, what I've noticed consistently, and in fact, I'm going to say the vast majority of the time, when people struggle with the assurance of salvation, they will say something like, I believe in God, I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world, and I believe that he saves some people, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure that he saves me. Right? I'm not sure that I'm among that group. It's not this like, oh, I, I don't think Jesus is real, or I don't think that the cross has value. There's this, there's this question about kind of personalizing the gospel and personalizing the, the reception. It's like, am I really among the children of God? Okay? And again, we're going to unpack this a lot more in later messages here. But what I'm going to say first is that the character of God or the goodness of God is just huge in this. I've, I've said this many times, but if you ask most people, and you can get somebody to be really, really honest, I mean like super vulnerably honest, and you ask the question, okay, what, what do you think that when, when God thinks of you, what, what comes to his mind, right? And in the heart of hearts, what people will say, their number one answer is something like, disappointed or let down when they when they really get down to it like when what does God think of when he thinks of and fill in your name in the blank there so many people will say I think God's disappointed in me I've let him down in some way and 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 that that gets at something again which is very very profound which we're going to come at in a little bit later so hold hold that thought again okay so what we're going to do today is we're going to spend some time first looking at how Satan has corrupted the character and goodness of God, okay? Because what's in the air, what's all around us, is this disruption and distortion of the biblical picture of who God is, okay? It's all over, and then we internalize that, and then that becomes the fodder of a lack of assurance of salvation. This is one of the elements. We'll, we'll, we'll fill this out later. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to look primarily today at two passages. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to look primarily at two passages today because we need to understand more about what Satan is doing and how Satan is seeking to corrupt our perception of the character and goodness of God. All right, so Isaiah 14. Okay, so Isaiah 14 is Isaiah, and and he is speaking to the king of Babylon. Okay, but we're going to read starting in verse 9. I'm reading here from the New King James. Hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. 
It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. They all shall speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments. The maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Okay, this is kind of a confusing passage. And as I said, if you look at verse 4 of Isaiah 14, it says explicitly that this is speaking to the king of Babylon. Everyone see that? It says in in verse 4, take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. But you notice that the language that is given here towards the king of Babylon far surpasses what would be reasonable for any human being. Okay, and he even says, you've fallen down from the heavens, Lucifer, son of the morning. And it's pretty obvious here that he's speaking not just to the king of Babylon, but to the spirit behind the king of Babylon, which is the devil. Okay, so this is not uncommon in scripture. There are times when someone will speak to someone, but they're actually speaking to the spirit behind them. Okay, so for example, Jesus sometimes will speak to someone, and you think he's talking to the individual, but he's actually talking to the spirit behind that person. There's a famous story that some of you are probably thinking of where Jesus is talking to someone, and you think he's having a conversation with one of his disciples, but he's actually talking to Satan, Satan, right? When he's talking to Peter, right? Get behind me, Satan. You're like, that's weird. What's going on? But it's because the way that, that... God sometimes operates as he speaks through the person to the spirit behind them. And that's what's going on here is he's speaking to the king of Babylon, but really through the king of Babylon to the spirit behind him, which is Satan here. Okay, I want you to notice a couple points here. So the first is in verses 9 and 10. So everyone's kind of amazed that this, the spirit has fallen down, that the, the devil has fallen down. Notice in verse 11, it says... The, your pomp is brought down to Sheol. Sheol is the place of the dead. And the sound of your stringed instruments. I want you to hold that thought. So, so the, the devil here has stringed instruments. It's portrayed. The maggot is spread under you. Worms cover you. And then in verse 12, it gets even more explicit about how Lucifer has fallen from heaven, son of the morning, and how he is cut down. But here's what I want you to especially notice in verse 13 and 14. Look at these statements that he makes. For you have said in your hearts, this is the devil speaking, uh, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. What's common between those three lines? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Elevation. Elevation. Yeah, like heights, right? So there's like all this language here of ascending heights. And then he says in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, and notice what he calls God. He doesn't say like Yahweh, I will be like the, the most high, right? So there's all this language here of the devil wanting to get high, wanting to be very elevated. But instead, the contrast is that his judgment is that he's brought low. He's rendered low. Okay, so Satan wants to go high. He wants to be lifted up. He wants to be at the, at the place of God, but instead he's brought low. Okay, and he's got this, this uh, stringed instrument. All right, there's another place in the Old Testament where A very similar dialogue happens, and I want you to look at this one too. This is in Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 is similar 
to that passage we just liked it in Isaiah in that it's ostensibly to the king of Tyre, but in fact, it's really to, to Satan. Okay, so look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 to 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of firing stones. fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings. They might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading, Therefore, I brought fire from your midst and devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Okay, so same thing. Notice how he's speaking to the king of Tyre, but this language, I think we can all agree, far surpasses what would be reasonable for any mortal to be able to receive, because it says that the person that's being spoken to was in Eden, right? Of course, we all know Eden. That's way back in, in Genesis. And this person was in the garden of God, was in the holy mountain of God. Obviously, this couldn't apply to the king of Tyre. So the king of Tyre here is being spoken through, but Satan is really the animating force behind uh, the king of Tyre. Now, a couple of observations here. Very similar to what we saw in the Isaiah passage. This beautiful being, this beautiful creature is here is called a cherub in verse 14. What is a cherub? Angel. Cherub is an angel. That's right. So that's why we believe that Satan was, was an angel, was or is an angel. And uh, notice here in verse 13 that he also has timbrels and pipes. What is a timbrel? Pipes we know. Yeah, it's like a drum. It's like a tambourine, right? So if I, I, looked, I looked up images of timbrels, and they all look kind of like tambourines to me. So you know those things you just, you know, you kind of look at a drum, and you just sort of smack it together. And, uh, and so he's pictured here as having timbrels and pipes. But because of this beauty, because of, in, in verse 17, his heart was lifted up. There's that same language again. He's cast down. Okay, so what we can say, I think this is a reasonable inference, here is there's three instruments now that have been associated with the devil. In Isaiah 14, what was it? Strings. Stringed instruments. And here it's timbrels and pipes. So there's three classes of instruments. There's percussion instruments and things that you hit. There's wind instruments where you like blow through them. And then there's stringed instruments, things that you pluck, like a harp or a piano. So all three classes, and all musical instruments actually fall into those three classes, all three are what Satan is pictured as having. Percussion, wind, and string. And, and he's an angel who's at these high levels of God, and he, most people would say we won't get into all this, but he was one of the archangels of God, along with Gabriel, Gabriel and Michael. But the devil was almost certainly from this picture, because we know that, that heaven is described sometimes, pretty good in Revelation, as a place where worship is occurring and there's instruments described there. He was probably some kind of a worship leader in heaven. And here, the devil was constantly in service of God, uh, supposedly offering him worship. But at some point along the way, he gets the idea, you know what? I'm done. I'm done being a channel of worship or a worship leader. I want that worship for myself. Mm -hmm. And he's cast down to the earth. Okay, And there's other places that we can see this. 
So for example, and we read this, we studied this passage, I preached through this uh, several years ago now. When we looked at the temptations of Jesus, the third and final temptation, what does Satan really want from Jesus at the very end? He's willing to give away his best for what? Worship. For worship, right? Satan is hungry for worship. He's hungry to be lifted up. He's hungry to be vaunted above all others. Okay, so this is what Satan desires. Uh, by the way, I will say that this is also why you know, people don't connect it together, but that, that passage that we talk about from time to time in 1 Timothy 2, that passage where it says about not wearing gold, pearls, and expensive clothes, we don't re pay enough attention to the ending where it says, appropriate for those who profess to worship God. That's how it ends, right? Why is that so important to understand? Paul gives us the rationale there. He's basically saying, if you are worshiping God, you're not trying to adorn yourself or bring beauty or attention to yourself. You're trying to put the attention onto God, right? So it is, it's satanic, I mean, not to use too strong of a language, but, when, but it is satanic, when we want worship and attention and adoration on ourselves. It is, it is um, divine to do what Jesus does, which is to point away from himself and to point to the glory of the Father. Okay, this is really important. Okay, so we're just laying foundation here about what the devil is all about. The devil is trying to draw worship away from God and bring it onto himself. He wants to be exalted. He wants to be lifted up. By the way, I'll make another comment. This is why... It is so important that we also put into practice in that same passage, 1 Timothy 2, before it mentions the command to the women, it mentions it to the men to pray, lifting up holy hands, right? So important to do that. This is a, a sign of surrender. It's a sign of worship to God. It's a command of the Bible. Very, very important. Okay, so this is the devil's MO here. This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to, to take glory from God and bring it to himself. Everybody with me? Now, you might think, why am I doing all this to get to assurance of salvation? This is all important. It's all going to come together, but we've got we to gotta hang with me here. The, one of the things that we now... Okay, that's the first point. The next point that I want to talk about is how important it is to remember that the way that Satan operates is that he sows, sows, S-O-W, sows. He, he casts a lie, he sows a lie which precedes a fall or a sin. Okay, so this is always how he does it. He, he gets you to believe some kind of a lie, some kind of a, a mistruth, and that's the, the stepping stone to a stumble or a sin. Okay? So, classic example is the very first sin in the whole Bible, right? In Genesis 3, where what is... What does uh, Satan do? He, he gets Eve and Adam to believe a lie about God and his character. That God really isn't, he's really not in it for the best of Adam and Eve. That he really has these other motivations. He's not, he's not a reasonable God. And when they believe that lie, that was the, the stepping stone towards the fall. Okay. One of the things that Satan has done really, really, really effectively is he's gotten us to believe all kinds of lies, subtle in subtle ways, about the character and goodness of God. Okay? And there's a, there's a term that, there's a friend of mine, his name is Paul Rainier, who gave a great definition of this that I really like, that we're going to use here. So the term, it's a biblical term, it's, the term is stronghold. Now, we've heard that, that definition or that word before, stronghold. And I, I really like this definition. A stronghold is an embedded error or an embedded lie. Okay, so it's, it's basically something that you believe, but it's not just like a superficial lie. It's like deep in you, right? So when I, when I picture the word embedded, I think of... Uh, we had some children with spray, they got paint in their hair from yesterday's activity, and like, it's not easy to get it out, right? Or if you get, like, gum in your hair, you ever had gum in your hair? It's terrible, right? It's like, it's like, to get it out, you basically got to cut your hair off, because it's not going to come out. Um, 
th this is what I think of as when something is embedded. It's so deeply enmeshed in, in something that it's just like, how in the world am I going to get this thing out? This is what a stronghold is. A stronghold is an embedded error or an embedded lie. And what Satan has done very effectively is he's gotten us to believe a number of, in subtle ways, a number of lies and errors about the character of God. All right, so let's, let's unpack this a little bit. There's many different flavors. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use one that, that I spoke about last summer. Uh, so one of the reasons that I despise, I, I just absolutely despise Calvinism, is because it is a flagrant attack, flagrant attack on the character of God, right? When all is said and done, the reason that I despise it is not because of, of uh, some academic reason or anything, anything more than it's just a direct assault on the character of God. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes from Calvin. I took a class on Calvin, a graduate level course last summer on Calvin with one of the leading Calvinist historians in the world. And uh, so I, I got to read hundreds, if not thousands of pages of primary sources. I'm going to read you a couple quotes here from Calvin. And it specifically relates to this topic of assurance of salvation and salvation in general. Okay, so here's Calvin. And this is the only reason why some persevere to the end and others, after beginning their course, fall away. Perseverance is the gift of God, which he does not lavish promiscuously on all, but imparts it to whom he pleases. If it is asked how the difference arises, why some steadily persevere and others prove deficient in steadfastness, we can give no other reason than that the Lord, by his mighty power, strengthens and sustains the former, so that they perish not, while he does not furnish the same assistance to the latter, but leaves them to be monuments of instability. Okay? Direct quote from Calvin. So what is he saying there? He's saying, why do we have this setup where some people persevere, they make it to the end, other people, they hear, you know, kind of the parable of the sower, they hear this the word and they're happy for a while and they receive it but then they fall away quickly and he says what's the bottom line reason he says there's no other reason we can give no other reason that the lord by his mighty power strengthen and sustains the former while he does not furnish the same assistance to the latter but leaves them to be monuments of instability okay do you hear that phrase monuments of instability right I, when i think of a monument i think of like the lincoln memorial or I don't know, something like that, right? This huge monument, you kind of go and admire it here. This is a common theme in Calvin, where he talks quite a bit about how God has ordained, for some secret reason that no one exactly knows, some people to be monuments of kindness and some people to be monuments of wrath, okay? Now, there's a huge problem with this, huge, huge, huge problem with this, which is that If we think about probably the, the, the most reliable analogy for God, according to Jesus, it's God is a good father, right? Like that's, that's the most common term that Jesus uses to relate to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know any father out there who says, I'm going to have children. Let's say, let's say I'm going to have 10 children, and I want seven of my children to be monuments, let's say five, five of my children to be monuments of my goodness, and I want five of my children to be monuments of wrath, and just out there for the world to see how wicked sin is, right? Like, you would hear that, and you would think, what kind of messed up sicko are you, right? That, nobody would want that. No, no father who's reasonable would ever want anything other than all ten of his children to be saved, to be uh, monuments of, of goodness, right? But this I idea, in varying ways, is all over the place. It is all over, it is in the air. And I don't care what your church background is, you have probably osmosed bits and pieces of this because it's just, it's everywhere, right? You hear it, a lot of you know, I work in Christian radio for three years, and you hear this percolate, even from people who aren't intentionally Calvinist, they're like, these little ideas kind of come out from them that this is somehow the character of God. Yeah? Uh, I, I hear this a lot, and this is one of the things that, that we're going to unpack that we have internalized where sometimes we will believe that, like, oh, God somehow in some way, I, I'm, I'm, not, 
I'm not loved in that same way. I'm just, he, and you, won't, you won't necessarily say it this way, but you feel like you're, you're just somehow passed over by God. Okay. So what God does, okay, so Satan falls, right? Satan falls, and he is now on the earth, and we know the story in Genesis about how Satan seeks to, to draw humanity after him. And it's very interesting when God makes humans, he makes us out of dirt and the woman out of man, of course, but he gives to each of us something like worship instruments, right? So we actually have strings in our, in our uh, throats, right? It's our vocal cords. Uh, we have wind, right? That also goes through our trachea. We have percussion, uh, with our hands, God makes these, these worshipers that are going to do and to, that are going to worship God and now reclaim the earth that has now, in some sense, fallen under the spell of the devil. And God wants now true worshipers who are going to restore what has been lost through the fall of Satan. Okay, now here's, here's what it gets really interesting. Uh, this is an insight, I, I've heard this a couple of times from a couple of different people, and it's, it's, I think it's a very beautiful insight, that when, when uh, God makes man, you know, the, the, the chronology is very important, that when God makes Adam, does his desire for Eve, is that pre or post the fall? It's pre, right? Like, it's all pre. So, remember, he's, he's, he's alone, and he's looking, and all of that is pre-fall. Work is actually pre-fall, as well as his, his longing for, for a wife. Okay, so that's all pre-fall. So, what's very interesting is that Adam, in his flawless, sinless state, before the entrance of sin into the world, is seeking after a bride, in some sense. He doesn't know exactly what he's looking for, but he knows that he's incomplete and he's seeking for, for what will be Eve. And of course, it says that when God makes man, man is in the image of God, right? And so what, what is that relationship? Why is it that when God makes man, who's still perfect, still not corrupted with sin. He's seeking this bride. He's seeking this wife. And what does that tell us about God? Well, what it tells us is that God, his desire is also for a bride, right? That, that both God and Adam, in some sense, are going to be on this quest for a bride. They're going to be seeking uh, a bride, of course, in, in God's case, it's the bride of Christ, which is the church. That from the very, very beginning of history, we see that in man, and as a, as a, in a reflected way, we see this in God, has this deep desire to love and be loved. This is a list that I got from someone in Texas. I love this list because I want you just to... to Hold this in your mind. I'm going to read a bunch of passages here. Just listen to these passages. These passages are, I think they're so beautiful because they reflect the heart of God that is going to be something that I want us to keep at the foundation of our understanding here to get a solid understanding of an assurance of salvation. Okay? And I want you to listen for a common phrase or a common pattern in this. And then here's the, here's the thesis here, is that I'm going to read to you a bunch of verses that are found from the beginning of the Bible to the end, and they express something about the heart of God, which is repeated and recurrent, and we could even say is his bottom line. Okay, I had a friend in, in med school, his name was Reuben, and Reuben used to go around and say, what's the BL? Give me the BL. And at first I was like, what's the BL? And he's like, BL is the bottom line. And I, he said this all the time. After a while, I would say, give me the BL. I picked it up, right? Uh, I've, I've kind of dropped that out of my, my lexicon. But uh, it's a catchy, a catchy phrase, right? So we know what Satan's BL is, right? What Satan's BL? I, meant, I talked about that before. 
His BL is to, is to get glory onto himself and take glory, take worship away from God. Now, what we really need to do here is understand what is God's BL? What is, what is God all about here from the beginning of Genesis? And we're going to see all the way to the end of Revelation. All right, Exodus 6, 7. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Leviticus 26, 12. I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. Jeremiah 7, 23. But this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people. And walk in all the ways that I've commanded you that it may be well with you. Jeremiah eleven four. 4. I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the, of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you, so that you shall be my people and I will be your God. Jeremiah 24, 7. Then I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Jeremiah 30, 22. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Ezekiel eleven twenty, That they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. That they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Ezekiel fourteen eleven, That the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions. But that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. Ezekiel 36, 28. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Ezekiel 37, 23. They, they shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Ezekiel 37, 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hosea 2.23, this is explicitly about Gentiles. Uh, then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. Zechariah 8.8, 8, I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and righteousness. Zechariah 13.9, they will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. Let's go to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hebrews eight ten. I will put my laws into their minds and write them onto their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Let's go to the last book of the Bible, almost at the very end. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 3. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. All right, who heard it? What was like... If you heard anything in there, you should have heard a recurring theme from the Torah all the way to Revelation. What was it? He wants a people. He wants a people, right? God wants a people, right? And like I said, we see that reflected right even in the creation of man in the beginning. So what God's BL is, what God's bottom line is, what God is really trying to do here is he's trying to create a people. He's trying to draw for himself a people. Okay, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. What Satan, as I mentioned, is trying to do, he's trying to distort God's character, rob him his worship, and bring glory to himself. So the real first challenge that we're going to have to embrace, and I'm going to end in just a couple minutes here, the real first challenge that we're going to have to embrace here is to believe that God is out to seek you Amen. to be in his people. Amen. Okay, like you personally. I mean, Seth, I mean, Christy, I mean, Bryant, and Jessica, and Sarah, and Laura, and Chuck, and Mark, and David, and Dean, and Tanya. I mean, everybody, right? He's seeking you personally. Uh, so many people who, who struggle with assurance of salvation 
don't internalize this enough. 2 Peter 3, 9, famous verse says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? This is like one of the many, many verses that just totally shows how ridiculous and evil Calvinism is. It says very clearly here, God is willing, uh, so God is not willing that any should perish, but wants all to come to repentance. Okay, do you believe that in your bones? Okay, you can probably believe this, at least that Second Peter 3, 9, right? Because God is not willing that you will perish, right? right. Hopefully you believe that. Um, and what I want you to start to do is to think about the fact that you, personally, your name is in that list of the my people that God wants to be included here. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to unpack this. I want you to believe that. I want you to, in your bones, start to think about what are the, the strongholds, what are the embedded errors of the embedded lies. And I'll try to further deepen this out, but I'm convinced that one of them is that you probably don't really believe in the deepest part of your marrow in the character and goodness of God as is biblically described. And you probably have picked up some wrong ideas that have come straight from the devil who's trying to distort God and take you away from him. All right, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, as we begin this, this sermon series here on the assurance of salvation, I want us to, to know very clearly what your goal is, what your purpose is in the unfolded revelation of God that we have from the creation of Adam to the close of Revelation. Your goal is to procure a people your goal is to procure a kingdom. And your heart is not to make monuments of instability or monuments of wrath, but your heart is to draw everyone into repentance. And I pray that we would all know in our, in our hearts, in our minds, that as we worship you and worship you rightly, that just as uh, you have your eyes on the sparrow, and the sparrow ha is of much less value than we whose, whose hairs are numbered. So, Father, I want to pray that you will help us to be aware of Satan's devices, to be aware of what he is doing in this world and how he has contaminated your great and glorious character. Father, help us to, to crush and to take captive these, these aberrant thoughts that are leading us away from you and help us instead to be able to tenderly, lovingly call you our Father. And uh, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.